Hello everyone. In this talk I'd like to introduce you to a method for approximating pi that was used by Archimedes, a brilliant mathematician and engineer from ancient Greece who lived in the 3rd century BCE. By modern standards, this isn't by any means the fastest way of approximating pi, but it's quite elegant and intuitive. I like to think of it as sandwiching pi because it involves fitting a circle tightly in between two regular polygons. Ancient Greeks sometimes took the circumference of a circle just to be three times the diameter. But if they had something quite complicated to do, like building a circular temple like the, the picture, then that probably wouldn't work. Your building wouldn't quite join up. So they were very familiar with the approximation 22 over 7, which, as you can see, starts well, 3.14. Archimedes figured out that that was a little bit on the high side, pi is less than that, and he also found a fraction that pi is more than. And the famous version of his result is that pi lies between 3 plus 10 over 71 and 3 plus 10 over 70, which is 22 over 7 again. In fact, the method that we're going to look at proves something slightly uh, more precise, but with less memorable fractions that I've put on the slide for you to, to marvel at. And we're told that in a lost work, Archimedes did even better with finding a fraction that is just a tiny bit above pi. As you can see, he's got really very, very close there to what we now know to be the um, starting uh, sequence of digits 3.141592 and so on and so forth. So how did he do it? The sandwiching method basically involves taking a circle and throughout the talk we're going to assume that the radius of the circle is one unit and you fit a regular polygon inside it and we're going to put them in blue and you fit another one outside it which we're going to put in grey and in the example on this slide I've used hexagons. Now, if you imagine this was some sort of overhead map of a system of roads and you needed to work out what possible routes there were for getting from A through B, C, D, E and F and back to A, and you tried to put them in order of length, then hopefully you would agree that the fastest route would be to go straight from A to B, straight from B to C and so on. In other words, to take the inner hexagon. The circular route takes you slightly off course but not too much and the outer hexagon is the longest route because it takes you furthest away from that uh, direct path between each pair of points and because it's quite easy to express the perimeter of the hexagons and the circumference of the circle this gives you a way of approximating pi 6ab is the perimeter of the inner hexagon and that is less than the circumference of the circle which is 2 pi times the radius that we said was 1 and that is less than 6 times the side length of the outer hexagon. So we're going to need to find out what a, b and x, y actually are to understand what this amounts to and before we do that I want you to do a couple of warm-up problems which should get you into the right frame of mind. So here they are if you just pause the video and have a think about these two problems and then when you've uh, done so you can carry on and we'll see how they apply to the question that we had about hexagons on the previous slide. Okay I hope you had a chance to look at those two problems. We're now going to go back to the diagram and try and find a b first of all. So um, the first thing we do is we connect those two points to the centre at o. And we give ourselves a triangle to play with, and OA is equal to OB because they're both radii of the circle, so they're equal to 1. And this regular hexagon is going to split the 360 degrees around O into six equal portions, so the angle at O must be 60 degrees. Because it's isosceles, we've got the angle at A and the angle at B being equal, and their sum has to be 120, so that along with 60 we get 180 degrees in the triangle. So each of those angles must be 60, and in other words we have an equilateral triangle, and that means that the side length AB must be the same as the side lengths OA and OB. So we can infer that AB is equal to 1. Next we turn our attentions to the outer hexagon, and remember we said that it fits snugly 
around the circle. And this is important because it means that the line, the edges of the hexagon just touch the circle at A and B. And at tangent points, the tangent line is always perpendicular to the radius. So we have two right angles now at OAX and OBX. And what you can do is then draw in OX, as I've done now, and consider the two triangles OBX and OAX. We have OA and OB being the same, we already saw that. We also have OX being a shared edge between these two triangles, and we have right angles in both of them. So if we wanted, we could use Pythagoras' theorem, and we would find that the, other, the remaining sides, AX and BX, are also equal. And in other words, we've got two congruent triangles kind of reflected across OX. And this is very useful because it shows that the uh, line OX splits the angle at O, the 60 degrees we found at O, into two equal parts of 30 degrees each. So we have 30 degrees now at AOX and 90 degrees at A, which leaves 60 degrees at X. And you may have seen triangles like this. It's what you get when you fold an equilateral triangle in two. And we're now close to the second problem that I set you, because we have uh, an equilateral triangle. In fact, it would be OXY. We're just focusing on OXA, the kind of folded in two version. And it has an altitude of one. Okay, OA, we said it's perpendicular to the tangent AX, and it's got length one. How do we work out the line OX and XA, the, the lengths of those two? Well, because it's half an equilateral triangle, we know sort of immediately by saying that, that OX is twice XA. And then we can just apply Pythagoras theorem quite simply, and we get uh, an expression for AX, one over root three, and XY is then going to be double it. So now we can put all of that together and say that the perimeter of the inner hexagon, six lots of AB is six, that's less than two pi, which is the circumference, and then that's less than the six times XY, which is the perimeter of the outer hexagon. You can write 12 over root three, but it's neater to say four times root three. So having dealt with the hexagons, we now move on to dodecagons because we're going to double the number of side lengths uh, in the two polygons. So we're dealing with 12 sides, but the procedure is basically the same. We still just look for AB, the side length of the inner dodecagon, and AX, half the side length of the outer dodecagon. We start just as we did before by joining AX and B to the centre. We reason again that AOB is 30 degrees because the dodecagon is going to split the 360 degrees into 12 equal chunks. And we've got, again, tangents at A and B, giving us two congruent triangles, uh, OXA and OXB, because we have a right angle and two sides the same. So we can infer that the other side is also the same. And again, just as we did before, we also infer that OX must therefore split the angle at O into two equal parts. This time, the two parts are going to be 15 degrees each. Now, so far, it's very similar to what we did with the hexagon, so I've gone quite quickly. But what we do next is different. I've extended OB and AX to meet at Z. And the reason that I've done that is actually that we know something about OAZ already. If you look at the angles, we've got 30 degrees at O and a right angle at A, so we have 60 degrees left over at Z. So it's another instance of this half an equilateral triangle. And again, we've got the height being one, just like we had before. So we can actually just simply remember that AZ is one over root three. And this uh, process of using a triangle that we learned about in the last step um, to help us out in the next step is something that would carry on um, when you keep doubling the number of sides in the polygons that you're working with. So, a second useful point about this triangle OAZ is that we have this angle bisector OX 
splitting the angle at O into two equal chunks. And angle bisectors are very helpful for telling you about edges like AX, which is our target. So a good way to think about it is then, how could we express the area of the red triangle, OXZ, the red half, if you like, of the triangle? Just pause the video and have a quick think about how you would express that area in terms of edges that are um, labelled on the diagram. So if you thought about that, then hopefully you would have realised that you can just use half the base times the height, because we actually have the base XZ being perpendicular to the height AO, and we know, we well, both of those are labelled. So we can say that twice the area of OXZ is just OA times XZ. And OA we've got, and XZ we can write as the difference between AZ, which we know, and AX, which is what we're looking for. But the really useful thing about this red triangle is that you can also describe its area in a second way. And you have to tilt your head a bit, but if you treat OZ as the base of the triangle, then BX, which is again perpendicular to it, because we said there's a right angle at B, OBX, the BX becomes the height. And because we know OZ and BX is just the same as AX, we again get a nice easy expression in AX. And putting these two things in bold together, the fact that they're equal, we can work out what AX is. I won't spend too much time working through um, the steps here, but it's fairly routine and it turns out that AX is 2 minus the square root of 3. So we're going to squeeze that knowledge about AX just a little bit further and we've got OA and a right angle and AX, so it's just crying out for us to work out what OX is using Pythagoras theorem. And if we do that, again, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining the uh, the numbers that come out, but it turns out that OX is the square root of 2 multiplied by the square root of 3 minus 1. So we'll come back to this uh, in a moment, but now we turn our attentions to AB, and what I've done is add this new point Y on the diagram. And again, I'm adding the new point because it gives me some triangles that I can try and say something interesting about and get some extra properties out of. So just like before, we looked at OAX and OBX, this time we're going to look at OAY and OBY and see if we can prove that they're reflections of each other. And they pretty obviously are because we've got OA and OB are the same, the angles at the top are the same, and OY is shared. So we have what's called side angle side congruence between these two triangles. And that tells us straight away that the remaining sides, AY and YB, must be the same, so Y is in the middle, and the angles at Y are the same, so both of them must be right angles. Now the next thing we can do is consider the triangle OYB that we've just been finding out about and compare it to triangle OAX, because it does look as if there's one of them is just slightly tweaked, kind of almost rotated around O version of the other. And in fact, we've got two equal angles at O, and we've also got right angles at A and at Y, in the lower left corner, if you like. So the two triangles have the same angles, so they're similar to each other. They're not the same size, but they are similar. And that means that their sides are proportional to each other. And therefore, we can put this all together now and get a figure for AB. AB is two lots of BY, BY is to AX as OB is to OX, and we've got all these values so we can just plug them in and simplify down and get our value for AB. And then putting this together we've got AB, we've got AX, and we started out with our insight that the perimeter of the inner dodecagon, 12 lots of AB, would be less than the circumference of a circle, which is 2 pi, would be less than the perimeter of the outer dodecagon, which is 24 lots of AX, which is like half of one of the sides. And when we put this together and, and actually calculate what it gives us, we've narrowed down pi to a range of about 0 0.1, which is not at all bad. 
So we have just looked at two cases, the hexagon and the dodecagon, and we don't have time to look at any others. But Archimedes did have time, and he carried on this process of doubling the number of sides in the polygon and using information from the previous step to help him out in the next step. And once he'd done 24-sided and 48-sided polygons, he got to 96-sided ones, and that was where he got the approximation that I showed you earlier. And if I give you a picture of um, what the diagram would look like with two 96-sided polygons in a circle, you can see it basically just looks like a circle, and you really have to zoom in to even distinguish the blue line of the inner polygon, the black line of the circumference of the circle, and the grey lines on the outside of the uh, outer polygon. So when you see how close the lines are to each other, it's no wonder that Archimedes' approximation was so good. Well, this brings me more or less to the end of my talk, but I just wanted to leave you with a couple of challenges. So the first one is try using this method of sandwiching with some other shapes. So try two equilateral triangles, try a couple of squares like in the diagram here, and try two regular octagons. And in each case, try and get an exact uh, figure for the perimeter of the um, polygons involved and then work out what it tells you about the value of pi. And then there's a second uh, question for anyone who's watching who knows trigonometry. Archimedes had the idea of um, uh, trigonometrical functions, uh, in other words, the relationships of sides in right angle triangles, but he didn't have a nice neat way of phrasing it, so I've avoided talking in trigonometrical terms. But if you have learnt it, then it provides a very neat way of talking about this method. See if you can show that um, what you would get if instead of having like a specific 12 sided polygon, let's say, you had an x sided polygon, um, what you, it would boil down to is showing that pi lies in between x times sine 180 over x and x times tan of 180 over x. Well, I hope you found this interesting and thank you very much for watching.